So a couple of comments about uh, the uh, some material that's been posted now. Um, the um, because the book uh, phase waiver is not used in <coughs> connection with the the stuff we're talking about from now until the end of the semester. Uh, you'll you'll be wanting to know what what you should be reading. So um, I'm going to point you to a couple of things. Um, let's see here. Um, if you just uh, go to the, uh, the course stuff on my on my uh, my website. There should be some handouts, <clears throat> and there's two papers here with the name Fetkovich, who um, those two papers are, are kind of the two papers that are required reading for what we're talking about from now until the end of the semester, okay? Um, the first paper, probably in the, in the order I'd recommend this well, gas well deliverability paper be read first. That's more about rate equations and, and uh, you know, the infinite acting. We talked a little bit about that and boundary dominated. It doesn't use those terms, but, um, but it's there. So that's definitely the first, I think, the first starting point. And then after, after Easter, we'll probably make it to what we call the material balance for gas reservoirs. And there, um, if you're looking for something to do during the Easter vacation, you break your leg, you don't like to ski, <laughs> whatever, or you don't celebrate Easter, you still have some time off, um, you could read this second paper where, again, Fetkovich's name is, is there. And that's about the, the gas material balance. And that's, that's a paper that um, um, you can, I think it gives even though Fetkovich himself had, uh, I think his very first publication was about gas material balance back in the 60s. Um, those papers are referenced in, in this paper. So I think this is a good starting point for, particularly for the course. Um, and it talks about everything that goes from the very simplest material balance to the most complex material balance. So it's kind of, and then the one that it really is, is discussing with field examples is um, the so-called pod aquifer, and, and that's kind of a midway between the most complicated and the simplest. It's a fairly realistic uh, <coughs> material balance that can be used in, in many gas reservoirs, um, in conventional reservoirs that have permeability is greater than about 10 millidarcy. So most of the North Sea fields would obviously come in that category. So those are the two things that you need to read and study and, and really try to understand. And all the stuff I talk about uh, from now to the end of the semester should, in principle, um, be pointing to something in those papers. I won't go look for it, but it'll be there somewhere, hopefully. Um, and then the last topic, which if we get there, if we have time, is this decline curve. I, I mentioned the ARPS equation last lecture, I think, uh, the decline curve equation for boundary-dominated systems. Um, we'll probably get there, even if it's just a lecture or two. And again, um, that topic um, was really put on the technology map, okay, the original ARPS papers from 1945, so just at the end of the war. So it's like old stuff. And it was based purely on historical production data from the, in mostly the United States, but which was of record, um, how oil rate, you know, kind of chugged along and then it started dropping, and how did it drop as a function of time. So ARPS just kind of fit that uh, to these equations, and, and so that was what we call a, a purely empirical data based, uh, based on data interpretation. Fetkovich in 1980 wrote a paper which is not here but will be by the end of the semester. It will not be required reading for the course, but it, it will be given as a supplement to what I talk about. Um, he, he put technology into what was a purely empirical equation in 1980. And so that's, um, that's a paper that I need to post and I haven't as of yet. So the name Fetkovich um, is, is uh, 
is in all three of these. And, and of course, there are many other papers, and there are references in the three papers here uh, where he's the, the author. Um, to many other people who have worked in the same areas, the rate equation, the material balance, and there's probably 50 or 100 equa uh, papers on each one of the topics, decline curve and so forth. But he really was um, a pioneer in all three of these areas. And, and, and so um, that's the reason I use the papers, because I think they, in addition to providing the basic theory, they, all of his publications um, are, are based on data verification. In other words, um, he worked for Phillips Petroleum Company and it was just his nature. He grew up uh, poor in, in um, Pittsburgh, outside of Pittsburgh, a small you know, industrial city in the United States, and basically wanted to get out of the poverty of that you know, steel mills and, and, he, and basically, uh, but he had a, a firm grasp of uh, the respect for, for real life. It wasn't just a theoretical, you know, teaching at a very high theoretical level. But what he did, he um, was respected in the theoretical part of petroleum engineering, and it was in part because he, he brought so much verification of the theory with measured data, which is always nice. And uh, so, so that's why those, uh, he's going to be a name you hear many times. Um, so that's, uh, that's out there. So basically the well deliverability paper first, this MB for material balance second, and then, you know, if at the end of the semester you want to read something else, then his paper on decline curve analysis will also be there. So that's the that's the one comment I wanted to make about the uh, reading material. And I can give you, a, I think I've maybe mentioned it before, just as an anecdote, um, I think his publication started in 1960. He was instrumental to, this is the history lesson part of the course. Um, uh, he was um, instrumental in the first development of the North Sea, both in Norway, the Ekofisk area. Um, by then he was basically the head reservoir engineer for Phillips Petroleum Company. Um, he was very active in the Hewitt gas field development, which was the very first, you know, big field developed in the North Sea, the gas field I've mentioned before. Um, so he started these publications in the 60s and did continued to publish through his retirement around 1990 something. Um, and I think it was around 1990 that he, um, he only had a bachelor's degree from uh, University of Pittsburgh uh, on his accreditation. But he'd done all this work and so I, I recommended that he maybe compile his collection of publications into a, into a, uh, a book, if you will and submit it as uh, the requirement for what's called the Doctor of Technology degree here at the University of, of Trondheim has this kind of degree. And it's basically a degree I think no longer in existence, but the idea with the degree is that if you've done independent research, you're not supposed to have an advisor, and you've had done independent research, published it, and had it in a sense adopted by uh, so-called peer-reviewed journals, then it's you know, evaluated uh, for the degree of doctor. It's much, what, it's much similar to what the Norwegian uh, medical doctors, when they get a doctor's degree, not to practice medicine, but a doctor's degree academically, it's much the same kind of thing. So he did that, and he received his doctor of technology degree here at the university, um, I think around 1990, in the 1990s, I don't remember. And uh, that, uh, uh, I think that was uh, very nice. There was... Um, on his uh, committee was, uh, at the time, uh, not just Stanford University's most famous professor, but probably the entire industry's uh, most famous professor, uh, Hank Ramey. Uh, Hank Ramey was um, uh, he was kind of the father of what we call modern well testing. I talked about well testing, pressure transient analysis. He was like the guy, okay? And um, uh, most of the, the technological bosses who are still like in Schlumberger and all the, the heads of all the, you know, the companies, if you look at all those people, they probably all got their PhD at Stanford about that time when Ramey was there and if they could associate themselves. So Ramey was one of the committee members 
And the other committee member was, I believe it was Rajapal Ragabog, who did his PhD um, at St Stanford University, I think, with Rangi. Um, I think his first master's degree was at University of Tulsa. And that's where he ended up teaching as a professor for many, many years. And Ragavon has written a book on well testing. It's called Well Testing. It's about this thick, and it's probably one of the most detailed mathematical um, uh, books covering the subject of well testing. And it's if you're really interested in working with Tom Yelmert and well testing and differential equations and stuff, that's the book you need to try to start to understand. Uh, so anyway, Raj and and Hank Ramey were on the committee of Fetkovich, and they um, so. Um, so he's uh, kind of part of our university, so to speak. So it's, it's nice. Um, let's see here. So that was the, the one thing um, I wanted to mention about, about reading material. And then a second uh, thing I've posted and the reason for that is because of my comments about reservoir simulation last lecture, which were kind of hard. Um, the reservoir simulation, which is really just a, a very um, important, uh, very mo much more complex application of what we're talking about, the rate equation and material balance. Um, the course taught here at the university, uh, the department, uh, does not really talk about, as I've, I've discussed this with the, with the professor, that it doesn't really talk about the, the PVT part input to the reservoir simulation model and why it's not taught, I'm not sure, or why it's not discussed or mentioned. And your problem, I think the next problem is at four or five. You're doing now four? It'll be five is actually to give you exercise in, in trying to figure out, you know, what are all these properties in this format of a reservoir simulator. So that's, it's kind of giving you a little taste of that. Um, and so, so what I did is um, there's a, this is also on my website here, let's see. I made a directory, a new directory called Reservoir Simulation. And um, I don't think I will ever <laughs> be teaching a course in reservoir simulation here at the university. You never know. But um, it would certainly be a challenge. But there's a, a guy named of Keith Coates, and he's a little bit analogous to, to, uh, um, to Mike Fetkovich, um, but in the era of reservoir simulation. He, he was the first graduate of the University of Michigan. Now, the University of Michigan was the mecca of PVT. Okay, it was Donald Katz was the main professor there. Um, and uh, this was back in the, started I think in the four, early 40s, maybe he came, maybe Katz came there in the late 30s as far as I know, I'm not sure, but um, the first, I think, PhD student of Donald Katz was Marshall Standing. Standing, you've now heard about enough. Okay, he also is linked to this university. So you don't have to be Stanford to be associated with the, with the real pioneers in, 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 uh, in the industry. So Standing was uh, one of the first, uh, if not the first, PhD student of Donald Katz. But to get a PhD at University of Michigan was also a very big deal. And Keith Coates, I think, I'm not sure when he got his PhD, but um, it probably was um, close to about when I was born. <laughs> I think he's 83 now. So uh, in the late 50s. And he was very interested in mathematics, applied mathematics. And as I tried to teach you in 1949, the first computers were published being used in petroleum engineering. Remember the Ratchford Rice? Uh, that was actually after 1949. It was Muscat in 1949 who published the flash calculation, the Rashford Rice algorithm. So that was 1949. And, and that was the time when computers started becoming available. And so uh, Coates has, went to the University of Michigan uh, to get his undergraduate and then his PhD degree. 
that he was interested in math. He wasn't interested. Everybody who got a PhD from the University of Michigan prior to that had to do laboratory work. So standing, he made the measurements of the Z factors and densities of oils, he measured K values of systems, and, and he and, 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 I don't know, probably 50 or 100 other PhDs who are all now kind of famous, now probably retired or dead, in the industry came out of that school. But, but uh, Coach was not interested in spending time in the laboratory. He was probably a class like me. I don't know, maybe, maybe not. But he didn't want to be in the laboratory. He wanted to do mathematics. So he was basically one of the first to pioneer uh, the building of these Lego blocks, okay, putting together not one Darcy equation in material balance, but 10 and 100 and a few hundred. And a few hundred back in the 60s uh, was a lot of computing requirement. So he, um, so this is a collection of all of his papers, probably posted illegally. I think you're supposed to buy these from the university, from SBE, but you know, you guys get it free anyway. And one of the things that he was asked to do, um, he's still active, but uh, was to write a chapter on reservoir simulation in uh, what is called the SBE, uh, Petroleum Engineering Handbook, okay? And it's covering every topic from drilling to reservoir simulation and everything in between. And there's a topic on everything. There's probably a topic on PVT, I don't know. But, but within the reservoir simulation, he was asked to, to, to write this for this latest version. And it's like, this is volume five and it's this thick. So it's like, <laughs> of course, nobody, yeah, so the, but uh, it's kind of, it was the, at the state of the art, supposed to be the state of the art technology for, for this particular topic. And whenever it was finished, I don't remember, maybe 10, five, 10 years ago. And he asked me, well, first he asked uh, uh, all of the people who he, I guess, had a lot of respect for who had done work in reservoir simulation. These names are, are quite, uh, quite well known. Dave Ponting. He wrote the Eclipse 300, the compositional simulator, which some of you will use. Um, uh, we've got uh, Tony Satari, who was co-author of the book with Khalid Aziz, who is now a professor at Stanford University. Uh, John Killo is one of the industrial uh, you know, giants at Landmark, Halliburton. Uh, John Wallace was a specialist, if I remember right, on uh, solving matrices, very complicated matrices, because you get these monstrous, you know, matrices. And, uh, you know, I, in all honesty, it's, it's not my area. This is stream, streamlined simulation. It's a whole new brand of simulation that came out, I think, of Stanford University about 15 years ago. Uh, this is Marco Tila, who's kind of the guy there, and I think is his, uh, his partner in crime. And in this chapter, which I, I want to post, he asked me to write about PVT and reservoir simulation, okay? So I thought that since if you do take the reservoir simulation course here at the department, nobody's going to talk about PVT. They're going to talk about forward differencing and backward differencing, and I don't know what they're going to They're going to talk about the things that these other uh, people are, ta are writing about. So it's probably a good, a good chapter to read regardless if you're going to do reservoir simulation. But... It's kind of my, my last hope that you'll see PVT in connection with what you'll usually do in reservoir simulation in the future. Anybody who becomes a reservoir engineer here will do reservoir simulation. And so this is at least my best stab at how PVT is related to reservoir simulation. So this is out there as well. So it's not to read now necessarily, but it's, um, it's uh, for the future. So those are the things that I have posted. Okay. So so we're gonna we're gonna talk today about the application of Darcy's law. Um, and if we talk about flow in the horizontal direction, x or y. Uh, that can be written as K over mu, and then the pressure uh, drop, uh, since there's no gravity involved, 
dx. Now, don't get this x confused with oil molar composition. <laughs> okay, there's no subscript. It's just the dimension x. And everybody's seen this, but who taught this to you? Obviously, you didn't get it in high school. Who taught? Who? Huh? Katie. Katie. Okay. Torstetter. All right. So, did anybody talk about the way Darcy's name is actually spelled? Are there anybody from France here? Okay. Do you know how it's spelled? Do you know how it's spelled? No. Okay. I don't know why they do it this way, but it's apparently this. Is that is that French? Maybe. Okay. Anyway, that's the way the name was spelled, Darcy. Um, of course, Americans got a hold of it and simplified it, so it's now Darcy. So that's the first thing you probably were not told. Uh, the second thing is that did the ones who taught this, Torstetter and and the PhD, Katie, did they tell you that? Darcy did not talk about permeability at all. All Darcy did is he said that this thing here is a constant. That the velocity of flow, or the rate of flow, in fact, through a porous media was proportional with the pressure drop across the, the distance flowed. Okay? That's what Darcy said. Didn't say anything about permeability, didn't have to deal with the units. Later, later we, we did that. Um, did they tell you who actually decomposed the constant into a rock property permeability? That's what this is. So K is a rock property. Okay, and mu, as you know, I hope no, is a fluid property. And Darcy, all he cared was that there's a proportionality constant between the flux, the rate. He was trying to help the city of Paris, if I understand the story right. I'm sure if you read it on Wikipedia, it'll be right, and it won't be quite what I, but my story is going to be more interesting. So there was a problem of trying to clean up the sewage in Paris. I mean, back in 18, whatever this was, 50s, 60s. And he was going to help do that. He was an engineer, okay? And the idea was to put some kind of porous material through in a pipe instead of just flowing this junk through pipe that you were going to flow it through a porous material and I guess it would clean it up or something I'm not sure okay but but the point was that you needed to know kind of like how did fluid w mostly water flow through a porous medium okay or maybe they were trying to transport clean water quote unquote clean water uh, to people and they wanted to put it through a some rock or stuff to clean it up a little more before people started drinking it. So it was something along those lines. He was called a sewage engineer. And all he cared about was what was the pressure drop required to get a certain amount of flow through a certain distance of, of rock. So that's what it was. And then it was, as I understand it, again, probably wrong, but it was people, I think, at uh, University of Pittsburgh, together with Muscat, who was the head reservoir engineer for Gulf Oil, which was, their headquarters was, was located in Pittsburgh. Pittsburgh's in Pennsylvania, which is where both Ramey and Fetkovich grew up in the mining towns there, okay? And it is also where Keith Coates grew up, Pittsburgh in, in Pennsylvania, in that area. So it's kind of, it was kind of the small mecca of future petroleum engineers, you know, in, in, in the old days. So these guys decomposed it because we were not going to be flowing, you know, Parisian sewage water. We were flowing oil and gas. And so they made this differentiation between the rock and the fluid property. And I think it was in the 1930s. And I think there was a guy by the name of Botset. This is a little before my time, and I probably should know this better, but... These are the people that actually did this decomposition into Darcy's Law, what we use today.
And if somebody wants to contribute to the class, you can do the Googling and the Wikipedia, and, and you can come and tell and correct me next week what I should have said, and then I'll try to remember that and tell it. Okay, but it's, it's approximately correct. So this is around the 1920s or 30s, I think. Um, let's just say the 30s. Okay. So, let's see here. So I wanted to kind of use this equation to come up with a, a relevant e equation for petroleum engineering. Okay. I kind of wanted to let you guys do that because it's a very simple differential equation that you should be able to solve. So what we want, what I want you guys to do is to take and say that we drill a well into a formation of thickness H and I'm going to make this a very idealized um, piece of rock but it's you know it's better than talking about sewage in Paris okay so we've got a we've got a reservoir and this is a side view of that. We drill a well. It's, you know, geologically in a formation down 3,000 meters in the in the reservoir. This is rock. Okay, we've drilled a hole um, that's about yay big, um, uh, maybe nine inches, ten inches in diameter, and we're going to assume that the pond, as we talked about last, is round. Ponds are not round. But we're just going to assume it's a round pond. So this thing is kind of like if I take a cutout, now we're looking kind of not from the side, but a little bit from the side and above. And the distance here is the radius to the outer boundary. And at the outer boundary, in some miraculous way, we're going to say that the pressure at that boundary is going to be held constant. Now, forever, okay? This is going to be our first simple assumption. Now, how that could ever happen, we would have to have, I don't know, an oil reservoir and have to inject water at the outer edge to keep the pressure constant. It's not going to happen. But, okay, let's just make that assumption. And this thing actually goes around, you know, all the way around 360 degrees. I'm just not drawing it. So the total area is, is, is a whole 360 degrees. And we're just looking at a piece of the cake. This is the thickness. This is the rock. And then we're going to impose. The, OK, and then, well, let's, let's. OK, so this is the center line of the well. And this radius of the well here we call R W and if I said it was like nine or ten inches in diameter then it's half of that okay and if you want inches in, 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 in centimeters you have to multiply by 2.54 zero 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 because it's an exact conversion 2.54 centimeters per inch so that's about about uh, just to make it simple five inches which is times 2.54, maybe 4 inches, let's make it 4 inches, and we get something around uh, 10 centimeters in radius. Okay. I think that's about normal, 4 inches around 10 centimeters radius. And then the distance out here, RE, for a normal well, I mean, what's normal, but for a commercial well in Oklahoma or somewhere else, 
the drainage area, the drainage radius of a, a normal well, okay? Take Oklahoma City, for example. If you look at pictures on the internet, Oklahoma City Field, and you'll see them, it, it was like the Wild West. This was like 1915, 20s, in that period. They had a well, they had maybe, in the building size here, they might have had three wells, okay? So this could be as little as 100 meters, which, or even less, but for most situations not, to several thousands of meters, okay? That's the range of drainage for a single well, a money-making well. Um, the thickness, you can make money on wells that are three meters thick in Oklahoma. I know people who live better than we all will. You know, they've got a few of these wells with three meter thick. So you've got a few meters, three to 300 meters thick. And in Columbia, there's a field that's like 6,000, 7,000 feet thick. That's 2,000 meters, so you can go up to 1,000 plus. Okay. So these are kind of the dimensions. H would be the total thickness of what's producing oil. That's like, that's oil or gas. Well, we're going to talk about liquid here in the beginning because you guys are going to drive this equation. <laughs> okay, like it or not, during the break. So we're going to talk about liquid. We're not going to talk about any compressible gas or anything, okay? So I think these are the dimensions. This is kind of an approximate. Even though the, the pond is round, it's not really round, it really doesn't make much difference how the, the rock going into the pond behaves, okay, being round or not quite round. Uh, so this assumption of, of the cylindrical geometry is not a big deal. You could have a triangular geometry, and the answer would not be much different. Okay, we'll talk about that later. So, so this is our, kind of our differential equation. And for, the, for this, what we call pseudo-steady state, or boundary-dominated flow, um, we're, we're basically going to say that... Um, uh, I told you that boundary dominated flow, you could measure it if you went into the reservoir and, and you measured how fast was the pressure dropping at any point. That's how I told you you could do it. But what it really means is that if the pressure is dropping equally everywhere, it means that there's a, the same flux, the same volumetric flux flowing everywhere in, in the well, okay? So another way to say this is that the flux Q, okay, and I'm going to put oil in here, okay, just to make it a little more interesting than, you know, water. I'm going to say we have oil in here. So the oil rate at reservoir conditions, at any, and this is an RZ kind of, uh, there is an RZ, uh, what do you call it, coordinate system, at any radius and Z is constant. Okay? Any po anywhere in the, in the reservoir, we have the same flux moving. Okay, and when you get that condition, you're at steady state. And if you're at that condition, then you'll find that, th that uh, now, because we've got a constant pressure out here, the pressure's not dropping anywhere, so we can't, make our <laughs> we can't make our measurement of the pressure dropping at a uniform rate. So but basically, this is the assumption for steady, the steady state assumption. So we've got basically the, this is going to be constant everywhere. And we're going to say that this well, 
is open. There's no pipe. We didn't put casing. Or if we put casing, we shot holes in the casing. We call it perforations from top to bottom. Okay, so basically you have, uh, there's no resistance to flow at the boundary between the well bore, it's called the well bore, and the rock. There's no resistance to flow, extra, pipe or anything else. So we basically have the same kind of flow going on at any Z. So then we don't really have a two-dimensional problem, okay? So it makes it a little bit easier. The only dimension we have things are going to be different is in the radial direction. But even in the radial direction, the volumetric flux, or the, actually the mass flux, if you, want to get, if you want to get, you know, picky about it. But since we're assuming density is constant here, <laughs> okay, then if it's a volumetric flux or a, a mass flux, kilograms per day, it, it doesn't matter. Okay? It's actually a mass flux. I kind of skipped this over. That's material. That's a mass balance, okay? And the fact that if we're going to assume that the density of this oil is constant, it's not dependent on the pressure, which varies from in the well bore outwards. We're just not going to worry about that pressure dependence. Then, then we can make this we can make this statement here. We're also going to assume that the oil viscosity doesn't change much for, for, for whatever reason. I'm just going to, we're going to basically say it's constant. And, and then what we're going to do is that we're going to take the oil that enters the well bore, we're going to take that to the surface, okay? We're going to take that to the surface through the pipe, which I'm going to put through Mr. Botset and uh, University of Pittsburgh, got twisted off there, and here we've got our grass and trees, okay? We're going to bring it to the surface, and then we're going to put it through a separator, and we're going to get out this many barrels per day of oil, okay? This is our process. My granddaughter loves birds. I'm always taking pictures of birds everywhere I am in the world. Take pictures of birds. Okay. All right. So. <clears throat> And let's say that the initial pressure in the reservoir, like this, shallow well, maybe this is your well, you're, you bought some land in Oklahoma, you settle down and you drill a well, and you get, you know, maybe it's not very much, uh, 100 bar, for example. Um, And what we're going to say is that what happens to the oil when it goes from the well bore to the surface, or any, kind of anywhere in the reservoir to the surface? What happens to that oil? In general. If there's any gas, 
that would be, let's say, in solution in the oil. If there's any gas, if this is greater than zero, then this oil right here will be less than the oil rate that we're talking about down in the reservoir, which is constant everywhere. So that needs to be taken into account. And we're going to so simplify <laughs> this, this problem so, so as not to make your life any more difficult than it already is. You guys are experts on Blackwell PVT tables now. I'm going to show you the assumption from 20 bar to 100 bar. that for practical purposes, this is 1.1. 1 .1. You know it's going to go like that, right? If this is the bubble point. And then this would go down like that. And for the viscosity, uh, let's say that this is it's a nice oil. Uh, give it a nice viscosity like in Norway or, uh, you know, you know, one centipoise is a nice oil viscosity. It's kind of like water. It's, it's not like I'm just building the number one. Um, we, we could say, I'll give you 0.5. Uh, that's lower than water, but it's actually not lower than water viscosity. What's the viscosity of water? You guys, we didn't talk much about water. What's the viscosity of water? You remember? Huh? Over here in the tap. About one centipoise. Okay? But typical water viscosity in reservoir conditions because of the higher temperature is typically about a half centipoise. 0 0.4, 0 0.6. So it's actually a half centipoise. So this is actually the <laughs> viscosity of, typical viscosity of water in petroleum reservoirs but because of the temperature, okay? Higher temperature, lower viscosity. But let's just say the oil viscosity is about this, and it, it's going to go up somewhat with pressure, but not a lot. And then if we looked at the viscosity below the bubble point, this is our bubble point because of the way the BO looks. Uh, this viscosity here would actually, if you measured it, would look something like this. And the way I've drawn this, I'm just going to tell you that making the assumption of this one point one cubic meter per standard cubic meter, and viscosity of oil being approximately constant, equal to point five centipoise is not a bad assumption. Okay? It, I'm just making your, like I said, your life a little easier when you do the derivation of this equation. So what I want you to do, you're going to have a break. You can use the break to do it or you cannot use the break to do it. But I'll let you have 15 minutes into the next hour. And what I want you to do is I want you to give me an equation, actually give yourself an equation because you guys were the ones who went and bought this little parcel of land. You put yourself up a little, a little house on the prairie, okay? And there you are, and you got your little kids playing around here. And we want to know how much oil we can produce, how much money we can make to feed, to buy the diapers and stuff, right? As a function of this bottom oil flowing pressure, because I can buy a pump in Oklahoma. I can run a pump down. I don't want to get into pumps. I can run a pump down, and I can keep that pressure right at 25 bar or 50 bar, whatever I want it to be, okay? So I want to know how much oil, and that's sellable oil, and by the way, today, thank goodness for some of us, 
What happened to the price of oil today? Just went over 40. Okay. It's been down below 30, so it's that. Okay, this as a function of PWF. You'll also have to have the P pressure there, which you can just assume is initial because we're saying that we maintain that pressure at the initial pressure. And I want you to derive an equation that gives me that. And I want you to do nothing more than taking Darcy's equation here to, to do this. Okay? So this is the challenge. Now in that equation, you're also going to find K, H, R, E, R, W, um, I don't know what else, viscosity of oil, formation volume factor. I gave you your H, it's three meters. You, you don't think I'm very nice, but wait. See whether you got can make an annual salary or not, okay? Okay. So at 10, maybe I'll give you 30 minutes, at 10.30, I want to see somebody's, uh, hopefully somebody. It doesn't have to be right, but I mean, I, I expect everybody to have something. You, you hand me and I'll look through them and I'll pick the one that looks the most right, okay? So 10.30, try to finish it by then.